What is going on, my Jets family out there? I want to thank you guys, like always, for tuning in to the Take Flight Spit and Fire podcast. You got me, Harrison Glazer, here to talk to you guys all about them Jets, like I always do. Appreciate you guys. See you guys coming in. Again, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being here. Appreciate all you guys. Now, what we're talking about today, we're going to be getting into the cornerback situation. Because as a lot of Jet fans feel, that's one of our biggest issues right now. Like we're looking pretty solid everywhere else, thanks to my man, Joe Douglas. Joe Douglas built this team, man. He got us wide receivers. He gave us a defensive line. And remember, you guys remember, uh, shout out to Braden. Sub my bro, see you in the comments. Remember, guys, you can bring stuff up in the comments. Bring up, uh, you know, a guy I'm talking about. I'm going to say a certain thing or different player you want to bring up or even different position. We'll definitely get into it all. But for now, we're starting with that corner situation because we were just saying Joe did a good job building other positions. And what's important to remember is in this defensive scheme, in a Robert Sala system, the name of the game, as you guys remember, we talked about it. The name of the game is getting to the quarterback. That's what it's all about. I remember I brought it up. I think it was last week, maybe the year before, uh, the week before. I was going to say year before. Ah, the week before. <clears throat> remember I was saying how with Robert Sala's defenses, they're always top of the NFL in quarterback hurries every season. Ever since Robert Sala's been with the 49ers, Take a look. They've been top of the NFL, either five or four or six, sometimes two with quarterback hurries. Even in 2020, when that defense was getting badly hurt, Bosa was out. Uh, Ford missed some time, I'm pretty confident. I don't have it in front of me, but there were a lot of injuries on that defensive front, and they still got quarterback hurries. The numbers didn't always translate. Remember, you know, we talk all about, remember, Carl Lawson, how the sack numbers weren't there, but the hurries, the knockdowns, the pressures, that was there. And that's what solid defenses are about, causing disruption in the backfield, creating chaos, making the quarterback make a bad decision, a quick decision, and it takes the pressure off of the cornerbacks. That's a big thing here. So yes, we're a lot better at linebacker, man. You guys know, if you didn't check it out, I wrote an article just this morning on Hamsa Nasseldine. You guys know I'm psyched on that kid. Nasseldine, Sherwood, CJ's healthy. Gerard Davis is looking good. Our linebacker core is looking pretty solid. And you guys know we had that podcast all about the defensive line. That guy's set too. So corner's a little shaky, but again, remember, Robert Sala's defenses are about getting to the quarterback. And that's what we're going to be doing. Carl Lawson, Quinn and Williams, Rankins, JFM, all of them. They're going to be eating in that backfield, guys. They're going to be living back there. And it's going to take the pressure off those corners and make coverage easier. But talking about the corner situation, one guy I definitely want to make is, you know, Bryce Hall. I don't think he gets enough, you know, credit. Like some people, you know, are saying that he only played eight games last season, but I really like Bryce Hall, man. I really do. And you can check it. I was on a, I'm trying to remember whose show it was. I remember uh, I was on a show as a guest and it was during the beginning of the season. And if you guys remember, I was all on Hall and they uh, had me back on a about a month or so ago, and they said they looked at the old episode because they wanted to see, you know, what takes I was right and wrong on, and they said I talked a lot about Hall, and that Hall, I, I knew he was going to be good. I just didn't think he was going to be this good this quick. Like, he legit last year looked like a CB1. He was everything you would want in a CB1. He's strong, good in coverage, good press skills. Now, I liked him a lot because I watched him at Virginia, and as you guys know, I'm a big ACC fan, and as you guys know, I watch a lot of ACC football. So I watched Bryce Hall a lot, and I really, really liked what I saw, specifically in zone coverage, press coverage, and his ability to just know where the football was, like his ball tracking skills and knowledge of where it was in relation, even if he wasn't even turned around, was really damn impressive. I liked him a lot of Virginia, and I felt that when he played – he looked like a first, second round talent, but because of injury, hint, that's what the article today is. Again, guys, check it out. You know my website, takeflightmedia.org. Uh, I wrote an article today on Hamsa Nasseldine. You'll see same situation. He had an injury, but he healed 
came back from it. That was the inju- issue with Bryce Hall. The issue was how is he going to be on that, you know, injury? Is he going to be able to be back? Well, last year he was solid. Last year he didn't have a problem. And last year he looked like a CB1. And you have to remember, he looked like a CB1, as I pointed out to you guys, with Adam Gase on a shitty team with shitty coaching. Literally everything working against these guys. Bryce Hall, guys like John Franklin Myers, guys like Bryce Huff. On defense, they looked really good. And that's what excites me. The guys that looked really good in that bad system with everything working against them. Man, with Robert Sala at the helm, with the pieces in the right direction, the right coaching. Man, I think we are honestly just tapping the potential of Bryce Hall. Because we said, you know, Gase, he couldn't develop a freaking quarterback. So if he can't develop a quarterback... Why would he be be able to develop and coach in anybody else in any other position? And we all saw Greg Williams last year. I'd been saying for a long time, you guys remember, I was saying on Twitter back at the beginning of the season, Greg Williams sucks. Greg Williams is a horrible defensive coordinator. And everyone was saying that wasn't true, but it turned out to be true. Greg Williams is a bad defensive coordinator. So now with better coaching, I feel like he's only reaching the beginning of his potential. So that's how I feel about Bryce Hall. Shout out. I see a lot of you guys coming in. Appreciate you guys tuning in like always. Thank you for being here. Shout out to Zach in the comments. Also saying what's up. Appreciate you guys, man. But yeah, Hall, I think he slept on. I think we're just tapping the beginning of his potential. The issue was staying healthy. When he played, he looked as good as anybody else. And as I pointed out, his call and and his best aspect was his zone coverage. That was the best thing in college, zone, press, ball ability. But people questioned his man coverage ability. Well, last year he lit it up. Last year he was an excellent man coverage corner. And again, looked like a CB1 as a primarily man coverage corner in that bad system with Gase, with Greg Williams. So Robert Sala, as you guys know, is going to be incorporating multiple different schemes, multiple different ways of doing it. It's not just going to be Adam Gase's one size fits all. There's going to be hybrid schemes with zone and man coverage assignments. They're going to use players to their strengths. So what's beautiful about Hall is we all knew he was great in zone and we all knew he was a pretty damn good press corner, but he proved last year pretty damn good man. So Bryce Hall could definitely be something special. But uh, yeah, we got shout out to you guys again. Appreciate you guys in the comments. John says right here, he thinks Bless Austin will take a big step this season. It's definitely possible, man. Definitely possible. So Bless Austin was the next guy I was actually going to get into. When he was healthy in camp, he was running as a CB2. Now, last year he wasn't that good. But again, it was in a bad system with bad coaching, not using players to their strengths. Bless Austin clearly showed us last year, clearly, that he's not the great greatest coverage corner in zone. He showed that. I mean, maybe he'll get better at it. But as a rookie in primarily man coverage uh, alignments, he played really well. He was excellent as a rookie. In fact, we were all excited about him. We're like, we got this kid just like Hall. We got this kid as a late-round pick. He was a steal in the draft. He's going to be something but he wasn't good last year. He's been saying, and again, if you guys want to check it out, I think it was like mm, toward the end of last season, but I tweeted out an interview with Bless Austin where they asked him about the season, and he said he was just looking toward the next year. Bless Austin said he was looking to take big strides and big steps into his year three. He wanted to start maturing and make that step to be a cornerback at the NFL level. So he acknowledged what he was doing wrong. Right now in camp, He's had some injury. So because of those injuries, other guys have gotten opportunity. And I'm going to get to those guys because that's exciting. We've seen other people stepping into that CB2 spot. And that's why, as you guys know, it doesn't seem to be a popular take on Jets Twitter. But I've been saying that I think we're better at corner than people are giving us credit for. Again, I'm not saying we got all-stars out there. I'm not saying we got Darrell Revis and Antonio Cromartie days. But I think we got a solid corner situation. I don't, I think it could get better. And we're going to get into that as well. Going to bring up some free agent guys, but again, Hall definitely think it'd be that CB one, just scratching the surface of the potential. And Austin, he plays really, really well in man coverage quite well, actually struggles in the zone. Isn't the best at tackling. Isn't the best at, you know, tracking the ball, but he can work on that maybe with better coaching with Salah now, but the potential's there. 
So Austin was hurt a little bit in camp. And as Austin was hurt, a couple of other guys got an opportunity. And one of the guys that got an opportunity, you guys know, is my guy. You guys know, since we drafted him, I did some research in him. I looked into him. I watched his play. And I got really, really high on Jason Pinnock. Like, really high on Jason Pinnock. You guys remember, I put that stat tree together because I started doing some polls and looking at some PFF numbers. And I was like, wait a minute. Hold on. Time out. I found the stat poll where they were saying how J.C. Horn was the third best corner in 2020 when it came to completion percentage against. Then I looked at who number one is. Number one was Jason Pinnock. Jason freaking Pinnock had the lowest completion percentage against of any corner in 2020. You guys remember I showed the other stat of just outside corners since 2019. He compared with Derek Stingley. Now, the big knock on Pinnock, the big, biggest knock on him is his speed. They say he gets beat by a speed guy. He gets beat by a guy over the top. He's not going to cover a speed guy. Well, yeah. <laughs> Take Bryce Hall, for example. Bryce Hall has looked like a legit CB1 at the NFL level. Checks all those boxes. But he ain't the fastest dude because he's big. He's a big, solid physical outside corner. That's what safety help over the top is for. That's what your certain alignments are for to take that pressure off of a guy or put somebody like a Javelin Guidry who we're going to get into. Those guys, a Guidry, a Michael Carter, an Eccles, those are the guys that are going to be covering the speed guys. So the biggest knock on Jason Pinnock, even though he was looking good and he was putting up these numbers that were comparable. Again, I'm not saying he's as good as them because he wasn't a first round pick, but what's interesting was his numbers were. His numbers were as good as guys like JC Horn and guys like Derek Stingley Jr. And what I found interesting was I watch again, coming back to that Tying into that ACC football, because as, I, as you guys know, I love and I'm a big ACC fan. I watched a lot of Pitt. And what I know about Pitt from my experience, and I know a lot of people, you know, I even have a family friend who actually went to Pitt, told me the same thing. Anyone who's been to Pitt who's a big fan will tell you their outside corners are on an island. And it's no surprise, because who's the guy that comes from Pitt, guys? Who's our boy from Pitt? Darrell Revis, the island himself. So outside corners at Pitt are on an island. And I said it before, if you put Bless Hall on an island against a speedy guy like a Tyreek Hill, his ass is getting beat every time. Every time he's getting beat. But that doesn't make him any less of a CB1 because that's not his job. So I view Pinnock very similar to the way I do Hall. Now again, not Hole is significantly better in coverage, but Pinnock is a physical corner that will play contested against anybody. If you watch him at Pittman, he's physical toe to toe with anybody. Excellent in the press, excellent at disrupting the receiver, excellent at a quick chuck. He's really strong, which I really like. He's got decent speed. In fact, they speculated his 40 would be at a 4 5. That's the same, basically, as. Bryce Hall. Basically, Bryce Hall and Jason Pinnock run identical 40s. And Jason Pinnock is about six foot, 200 pounds. Again, if you're putting Pinnock against Tyreek Hill, then I guess you're Greg Williams or Adam Gase, and you don't know what the hell you're doing. So again, I really like Pinnock, and he showed a little bit in camp. When he played in that CB2 role, They, from what I read from the beat reporters, he was making good coverage reads. He was reading Wilson well. He was reading the ball well, which is what I liked about him. Pinnock, like all guys, has great ball tracking skills. Like just watch some Jason Pinnock interceptions in college. Just go watch a couple. They're really fun to watch because that dude is looking at the ball before he makes the pick. He's really, really, his awareness is just awesome out there. So I hadn't dug too deep into him because I, I remember I mentioned to you guys, I was all into the pit edge rushers. Like I was just blinded by that edge rusher, man. I was too busy looking at Rashad, uh, Rashad Weaver and Patrick Jones. Like I was just, I was too focused in on watching the two of them just collapse pockets, like watching just tackles just destroyed and just, and just blasted into each other. So I didn't dig too much into their corners, which I should have because when Joe took them and I dug into them, I was blown away. So I really, really like Pinnock. I know other guys like I'm going to get into next, like Isaiah Dunn has actually flashed more 
but I really like Pinnock. I really do. Again, the numbers are there. The talent is there. The physicality is there. The speed is what you want in a corner of that kind of physical play kind of ability. But at the same time, he's got, again, almost identical speed to what you'd see in Bryce Hall. The coverage ability is there. The ball read ability is there. I really like him. But one guy who's really shined is an undrafted guy. And talking about that undrafted guy, he ain't just any undrafted guy. In fact, he's the highest paid undrafted corner in NFL history. History. No undrafted corner has ever been paid this kind of money. And what's interesting is Oregon State corner Isaiah Dunn didn't do much at Oregon State. He really, really didn't. But here's what's interesting. So if you look at... Isaiah Dunn and that team, for example, they were bad. (laughs) Let's just call a spade a spade. That team was really, really bad. In fact, they have like one win, two win seasons bad, like bad, bad. So a lot of people say that maybe the coaching, the situation that he was in might have contributed to why he wasn't as good because I dug a little deeper. And if you guys want to check it out, you can see it on my Twitter. I posted some Isaiah Dunn footage from high school. I went back and found some of his high school footage because his college footage wasn't great. I mean, there were flashes, man. There were really some flashes. This kid, he's like 6'1", 190 something. He's prototypical. He's got great speed, great agility, great Almost everything. He looked good in camp. In fact, as you guys know, I brought it up. I'm going to be starting to do new exclusives with one of the beat writers. I'm actually doing personal interviews with DJ Enemy, And I'll be bringing you guys uh, short little exclusive interviews on Twitter. And one of the first things I asked him in those exclusives was what player has shined the most to you? And, you know, especially at that corner situation, other than Hall, and his immediate answer was Isaiah Dunn. First thing he said was Isaiah Dunn. He's the guy to watch. He's got talent. Keep an eye on him. So Dunn, again, is an undrafted guy, but he was in a bad situation. The team was really bad for a while. The potential is really there. They trusted him enough to give him the highest contract of any undrafted cornerback ever. It's going to be interesting to see. It's really going to be interesting. So Dunn's an option. Austin's an option. Uh, Pinnock's an option. Pinnock's the guy I really think could be the guy, but Hall's the penciled in number one. Now, there's one guy that's a little slept on before we get to the slot, because I want to shout out to Zachary. He brought up the slot cornerback position. Definitely going to be getting to that. Don't get me wrong. Not leaving the slot out. Very important position. But before we do, one guy that might be being slept on is an undrafted guy from last year. And that undrafted guy is Lamar Jackson. So Lamar Jackson was undrafted out of Nebraska last year, and he was forced into a starting role. He, as you know, we had injuries, players that weren't playing well. Lamar Jackson was forced into a starting role last year. And what's amazing enough is out of all the Jets, of all the Jets last year, Lamar Jackson had the lowest missed tackle percentage of any New York Jet on that team. Just throwing that out there. Lamar Jackson's missed tackle percentage was 3.4%. He only missed 3.4% of his tackles. And he wasn't great last year because, again, he got beat over the top. Like, someone needs to teach Greg Williams how to be a coordinator, how to actually call plays. Because guys like Lamar Jackson, Bryce Hall, Jason Pinnock, shouldn't be on a guy that's going to beat him speed-wise. That's not the guy you want on him. Lamar Jackson is a beast. Look at this guy. This dude is strong. He's the kind of guy that you want covering like your Brandon Marshall. That's the kind of guy you want Lamar Jackson on. He's getting physical with him. He's going toe-to-toe with him. And again, lowest missed tackle percentage of any Jets player last year. Excuse me. And... (laughs) Shout out to Zach, man. That's funny. He says the Jets got the better Lamar Jackson. I mean, I wouldn't go that far. I love Lamar, man. I mean, you guys know I wanted Zach. Like, Zach's my guy, and I love that we have him. But, hell, if the Jets did what I want in 2018, we would have had Lamar Jackson. They would have shocked the world. They would have took Lamar at three. Everyone would have cursed him out and said they're nuts. (laughs) So I really like Lamar. But, man, Lamar Jackson, the corner, is not to be slept on. 
He's not. He was undrafted, so you don't you know expect him to be great out of the bat. He's got to learn. He was thrust into a starting role, and he played pretty well. Now, what Mike points out, which is interesting, he can definitely be a safety, Mike. You make a good point. I mean, I like our safety play right now, especially because you look at a guy like LaMarcus Joyner. LaMarcus Joyner, when he only played free safety in the NFL, his PFF rating is like a 91. His PFF rating is amazing. He kind of sucked as a slot corner. He's not the best in the slot and in that kind of coverage. But playing at free safety, man, this dude's lights out. So I really like Lamar, uh, LaMarcus Joyner and Marcus May as those two safety options. But don't sleep on Lamar Jackson. But like Mike says, he could play safety. I mean, he's a solid dude. He's about, I don't have him in front of me, so I'm speculating. I think he's like 6'2", 215-ish. Give or take. So he could definitely play safety. He's, a, again, a big physical guy. But other than getting beat by speed guys, he wasn't bad in coverage last year. So, again, all these interesting options. Jackson hasn't been in the mix, but Isaiah Dunn, bless Austin, and Jason Pinnock have all been playing that CB2 spot. And though Isaiah Dunn looks the best, no one's really said that Austin or Pinnock looked bad. So that's great. And Hall, CB1. That's it. So like Zachary wanted to before, he brought up Michael Carter starting in the slot. Man, I think Michael Carter is the starter. That's as far as I'm going to go. And that's a big step because you guys know how high I was on Javelin Guidry. Now getting into Javelin Guidry for a second, because I was super high on this kid. I liked him as an undrafted guy out of Utah. Javelin Guidry is a freaking burner. This kid runs a sub 4340. He runs it in a 429. Javelin Guidry is legit like running toe to toe with Tyree Kill. Like he's that kind of speed. Really special. But what I like about Guidry is he's physical for a guy his size. He's about 5'10, 190, but he's very physical. Uh, <clears throat> plays press quite well from what I saw. Again, limited sample limited sample last year, but he played press very well from what I saw. I felt like he was pretty damn good in coverage. I know last week, you know, Green Bean was saying he didn't think he was the best tackler. I mean, I didn't think he was bad. I would go as far as I didn't think he was a great tackler. Like his tackling never jumped out to me, but I never thought it was bad. So Gidry was my guy, especially because we had a corner that was one of the best corners in the NFL. We had a corner named Brian Poole and Brian Poole was one of the best slot corners in the league. Brian Poole gets hurt. Javelin Guidry comes in. Jets don't miss a beat. That's what I love the most about Guidry. If you can give me a guy that can come in for a top starter and not miss a beat, let alone be an undrafted guy from that year, man, that's exciting. That is 100% exciting. So I really, really like Guidry. But man, Michael Carter has been the guy. If you look at the camp reports, if you look at what's being said from the beat reporters, Michael Carter has been the guy. Michael Carter II, again, not to be confused, we got Michael Carter from UNC. He's the running back. Michael Carter II, Deuce, the corner from Duke, Duke University, baby. ACC, love it, both ACC. I love it. And as I pointed out, if you guys don't remember this, and this is one of my most favorite things, out of all the draft picks we took last year, Sorry, this year, out of all the draft picks we took this year, besides Zach Wilson and AVT, all of them come from the SEC or the ACC. Think about that. Out of the rest of the eight picks that we took in that draft, they all come from SEC and ACC schools. And that's what it's about, man. I've been saying for a while the ACC has definitely slept on when it comes to football. So we got ACC running back, Michael Carter. We talked about him the other day. Now it's about Michael Carter, the second, the deuce. And if you guys didn't see it, same thing. I tweeted out a video. I think it was two or three days ago. It was a highlight reel of a lot of his plays, man. Michael Carter is a guy to get excited about Michael Carter, very similar to Javelin Guidry, which when jet, when Joe Douglas took Michael Carter, I immediately felt, okay, This dude's got a type. And you guys remember, we talked about this. Javelin Guidry, Michael Carter. Both 5'10", both 190 pounds, both run 4'3". Javelin Guidry runs a 4'29". Michael Carter runs a 4'3". Both of these guys are fast as hell. 
Like we said, more physical for their size, but they also thrive in man coverage. They really, really do. John makes a good point. Many of them were captains. Man, that's the guy Joe's going for. Joe's going for the leaders. Remember what Salah said? Robert Salah specifically said, I'm taking guys that love football. I'm bringing in guys, free agency draft, that not only want to be here, but love the game. And that's what we've seen. We've seen guys that want to play for Coach Sala that love football. Carl Lawson loves football. He came here to play with Robert Sala. This is exciting stuff. Like John said, many of them captains, many of them leaders, solid picks. <clears throat> but don't sleep on Michael Carter, man. Because remember, my guy was javelin injury. I've been saying it. I even was saying, you know, all those stats on Gidry, the speed I loved in him. And remember, I was saying that I didn't think we were going to sign Brian Poole. While everyone thought, you know, back when free agency started, that we were going to bring him back. I was saying back then, I didn't even know if I wanted him. Because again, you get a guy like Gidry. Brian Poole is, I brought it up, I think he's 28 now. Take it back, sorry, Brian Poole is going to be 29. Brian Poole is going to be 29 in October. He's not bad. He was one of the better starting slot corners in the league. But again, Javelin Gidry comes in, the team doesn't miss a beat. And we're talking about a 22-year-old undrafted free agent. That's the point here, guys. If Joe Douglas is going to look at this and say, okay, and I brought it up right here, Brian Poole, in 2020, where are we? Here we go. Brian Poole in 2020 had a PFF rating of 77.1, which is damn good. Damn good. But Javelin Gidry, as an undrafted 22-year-old rookie, had a PFF rating of 73.1. Now, again, very limited sample size. But that's just so promising. Four points below one of the best corners on our team and one of the best slot guys in the league. So I was really high on Gidry. Michael Carter has been the guy in camp, as we were just saying. I think it's going to come down to both of them. That's what I think. I think we're going to be seeing four cornerback sets, and we're going to be seeing both of those guys being used. Because why the hell not? People tend to forget this. You guys remember I have my whole take on that, you know, slot CB2, just like you have CB1 and CB2. It should be slot CB1 and slot CB2. Because when you think about it, the corner, the, the slot corner, if I go to the camera here, <laughs> is playing the interior of the field, covering, you know, from what the outside corner covers to the middle. Now, the other side is the same damn thing. There is no difference. It's a slot on both sides. That's why I never got this logic of teams being like, I need one great slot corner and a bunch of outside guys. Well, you're better off with another slot guy in the middle. So guys, Javelin Gidry, Michael Carter, both of those guys could be in the slot. So what we could be potentially seeing in four receiver sets, to give you an example, Bryce Hall, definite cornerback one, no question, CB2. Is either going to be Dunn, Hall, sorry, not my apologies, Dunn, Austin, or Pinnock. And then in the interior, we have Michael Carter and Javelin Gidry. Now, we mentioned before, don't sleep on Lamar Jackson and don't sleep on Brandon Eccles. Brandon Eccles also fits that mold Joe Douglas likes. Drafted this year from Kentucky, kid's about 5'11", 180 pounds, also very physical, good man coverage. Runs a 4-3-4-40. Like, remember, I, I was tweeting about that. Think about that for a sec. Joe Douglas has three slot cornerbacks right now. And out of the three of them, the slowest one runs a 4-3-4-40. That's crazy. That's nuts. All three of these guys are burners. Javelin Gidry, Michael Carter, Brandon Eccles. These are three guys that are burners, keep up with basically anybody, physical for their size. And what's interesting about Eccles, Eccles is 5'11", though he's on the light side. I would actually be kind of interested to see how Brandon Eccles does on the outside. That's something I've honestly been thinking about a little bit. So Eccles is 5'11". He's a little light, though. He's about 180. But I'd be interested to see what he could do on the outside. You know, maybe give him a shot there. But again, you still got Austin. You still got Pinnock. You still got Dunn. And Dunn, the undrafted guy, was shot him like crazy. 
So that's exciting stuff. I think that is an undrafted, sorry, underappreciated corner room. Like Zachary said, people are sleeping on us at cornerback. Again, like I said before, I'm not saying, you know, these are like the Darrell Revis behind me, you know, the GOAT, Darrell Revis, Antonio Cromartie years. I get that. But there's a lot of potential, a lot of potential. And I think that's why when Robert Sala was interviewed about bringing in a veteran, I think that's why he gave that answer. He said, basically, listen, the guys that are available right now, no one's clamoring to sign them. I brought up a list. We're going to go through them in a couple of minutes. I have a list of about five, five or six corners that the Jets could potentially sign. Guys like Steven Nelson, he's still available. He wants to see what he has in these young guys. That's literally what Robert Sala said. Robert Sala said, why am I going to bring in a veteran now? Notice, kind of like Joe Douglas, picking and choosing his words carefully. <clears throat> One sec, guys. But like Joe Douglas, picking and choosing his words carefully, Robert Sala said, "It's I don't want to bring in a veteran cornerback now. This is the time to see what the young guys got. OTAs, mini camp, the beginning of training camp even. Beginning of training camp. You can bring in a veteran a little bit later on. Sup, Blake? I see Blake in here. Appreciate all you guys. John brings up Zane Lewis. There's a lot of young depth. That's the point. There's a lot of these young guys that Robert Sala wants to see. And like I was just saying, all these veteran guys, a Richard Sherman, a, a Steven Nelson, they're veterans for a reason. They can come in and pick it up in a couple of weeks. He wants to see what he has now. Like we mentioned before, all those guys trying to make it a cornerback too, the intriguingness in the slot cornerback position, this is exciting. And again, I think we're slept on at slot. I really, really do think we're slept on at slot cornerback. Again, like I was just mentioning how much I love Javelin Gidry and have faith in that kid. Michael Carter lighting it up in camp, looking even better. If I had a pick right now, I'd say even though I believe in Gidry, Carter's the guy. From what I've seen, from what I've heard, Michael Carter II is the starting slot cornerback as of now. And as I told you guys, I tweeted the video a couple of days ago, show him why I think that is. He's really, really was impressive in his days in Duke. But I think we're doing pretty good. I think we're pretty solid. Again, Bryce Hall, penciled in as that CB1, just happened that potential like we talked about. You know, coming playing for a bad team in a bad position, bad situation, only played eight games. He's just scratching the surface of what he can become. That cornerback too, we talked about all that potential. Yeah, like Tom says, Tom makes a good point. Shout out to Tom. He was saying, what's up? He says the veterans still won't know the system, just like the rookies. Sala knows what he's doing, guys. He literally said it. They asked him about the veteran, and he said, I'm not bringing in a veteran now. Let's see what we got. All those guys I mentioned on the outside, Austin, Dunn, uh, Pinnock, who I really like, you know, the guy I really think would be the guy. Maybe Lamar Jackson, all that potential in the slot. Brandon Echols, there's so much there. So I think at cornerback, we're slept on. I think at cornerback, Again, we're not the greatest, but we're not as bad as everyone's making it out to be, and it's not as big a disaster as everyone's making it out to be. But, but, <laughs> some people want to bring in a free agent, which is understandable. I mean, especially if you bring in a guy that has a proven track record, all he can do is make your team better. That's all he can do. All he's going to do is make your team better, and if it doesn't work out, hopefully you sign him to a one-year deal like you do with a guy like Pierre Desir. because right now, all these free agents available, this isn't the upper echelon guys. You guys know that. The upper echelon corners are gone. They were signed by mid-March. Third week of March, those guys were gone. Even Adore Jackson was there for a little while, and he was gone. The guys that are left are not the upper echelon guys. So the guys that are left probably can get on a one-year deal. Take a flyer on them, see what we can do. So there's a couple of names out there. Now, the one name that every Jet fan loves to throw around is Steven Nelson. We hear a lot about Steven Nelson. And the reason people like Steven Nelson is in his best years, he did look like a decent corner. But here's the thing you got to remember. In his best years, he looked like a decent cornerback too. Steven Nelson was never a cornerback one. That's an important thing to make sure getting clear. Steven Nelson 
who is never a CB1. If you sign him, he is at most a CB2. Granted, he's a veteran presence. He's had a couple of good years, but let's look at his PFF, for example. So if we look at Steven Nelson, he was very good in 2018 and very good in 2019 with PFFs of 73.8 and 80.5. That's what a lot of people are remembering. A lot of people are remembering his 2019 season. That was his best season. But we have to remember, Steven Nelson has been in the league since 2015. And if we go back to 2016, his numbers weren't good, 62. We go back to 2017, also not good, 65. We said 18 and 19 he was good, but last year, inconsistent again. It was down to a 67.1. So he's not a terrible signing. Again, at this point in time, you can probably get him on a one-year deal. You could probably get Steven Nelson on a one-year deal, maybe like three-something million-ish, maybe four million, maybe predominantly guaranteed. Would it be a bad signing? No. I'm not saying it'd be a bad signing, but we have to remember at that corner two position, there's a lot of intriguing stuff going on right now. And just like I you know, mentioned before, Austin, Pinnock, and Dunn. Dunn's look great, but Pinnock and Austin haven't looked bad either. So let's see what we got in these young guys. But Steven uh, Nelson is not a CB1. If you're drafting him to be that CB1, that's not going to be the case. So at most, he's a CB2. If you sign Nelson, uh, uh, Bryce Hall is still your CB1. So Jack and Blake are talking about Sherman, man. Let's talk Sherman, as Jack says. I was talking Sherman for a while. You guys remember when free agency started, I was super high on Sherman. Like Sherman was my guy. Like I was excited. I was like, he's a Robert Sala guy. He's followed Robert Sala from Seattle to San Francisco. He's going to follow Robert Sala here, but he's still not signed. And the way I look at it, and again, I could be wrong, is I felt that if we were going to sign Richard Sherman, we would have signed him already. That's the way I look at it. Robert Sala would have reached out to Richard Sherman, and this is what I thought was going to happen. I thought Robert Sala was going to reach out to Richard Sherman right when free agency began and say, uh, you know, I, I need a guy like you. I need your leadership. I need your attitude. I need you to teach these young guys what's what. I need you to be a motivator, the coach on the field. He might have done it, but I don't think that ever happened. So like Blake points out, Blake says Sherman wants to go to a contender. I agree that I don't think it's happening. And again, if it was going to happen, I think it would have happened already. So that's the way I look at the Sherman situation. I wanted him. You guys remember I was tweeting bad. I even wrote a personal letter. I don't know if you guys remember. If you check it out, I even wrote a personal letter. I was like, dear Richard Sherman, come to the Jets. We'll love you. We'll adore you. Sign Jets Twitter. Like I was ready, man. I thought he was going to come because why not? I mean, we said he's not leaving the West Coast, but at that time, there were rumors of him going to other East Coast teams. So I figured that wasn't the case. Maybe he would, you know, come. But if he was going to come, I think it would have happened already. So that's the way I look at it. Alec points out, you know, Stephen Nelson's got character issues. Jack says Sherman over Nelson. I, I think the hype on Nelson was too much. You guys remember I pointed it out. Right when everyone was all over Nelson and everyone's like, we got to get Stephen Nelson. I was like, well, it's not a bad signing but it's not what we're making it into. We're making it into like signing Steven Nelson is like getting that veteran corner that we need. That may not be the case. As I just showed you guys, he had two very good seasons and that was followed by two really bad seasons and then another bad season. He wasn't that good last year. So we don't know which Steven Nelson we're getting. He's 28 years old. He's not young and he's never been a CB1. Even those two years in 2018 and 2019, when he played his best football, he wasn't a CB1. So Nelson is not a CB1. Even Sherman, Richard Sherman, as much as he used to be a CB1, he's most likely not a CB1 anymore. I mean, I thought maybe, you know, maybe because he was hurt last year, maybe that's why he lost the step and he still had it. Man, if he still had it, he would be signed already. That's the way I look at it. If Richard Sherman was still a CB1, there's no way in hell he'd still be available. That's the, the simple nit and gritty of it. I mean, Richard Sherman at one point was one of the best cornerbacks in the league. So if he's not signed yet, 
He's not that CB1 anymore. He's not going in and blowing anybody away, going, oh, my God, he's so much faster than we thought. Richard Sherman is what he is. So just like Steven Nelson, that's not a CB1. So it's important to remember that no matter who you sign, no matter who you bring in, Bryce Hall is still your CB1. That is a fact. Bryce Hall will continue to be that CB1. And again, only eight games scratching the surface of that potential and look like a CB1 in those bad systems. So Tom points out, Brian Poole's not signed yet. Yeah, but I'm not looking at slot guys. And here's why. And another reason to bring it up is Brian Poole's still available. You know who else is available as a slot guy that I really like? Nickel Roby Coleman. Nickel Roby Coleman is still available and is currently a free agent. And I really like that kid. If you want a slot corner, I am a fan of Roby Coleman. I'm not saying he's great, but just like Nelson, he had a couple of good years. If you look at Roby Coleman in 2018, he had a PFF of 82.6. And then in 2019, it was 74.5. 2017, 80.7. He's had some good years. So I really like him as well, but I don't know if I'm looking at a slot guy because, again, I really like the position we are at slot. I feel like the unanimous with Jets Twitter, it seems, is that if we need a corner, it's an outside guy. I feel like, you know, you guys know, remember, I think Poole has still been available and not been on the Jets' radar because of Javelin Gidry. Javelin Gidry coming in, playing without missing a beat, playing at the level Pool was playing, grading just below him in his coverage grade as an undrafted rookie. <clears throat> Excuse me. Man, that's exciting. So I think Joe Douglas was excited by that. Why bring Pool back when we have this exciting thing in Gidry? And now Michael Carter's looking great. Michael Carter the second is looking amazing. He's been looking awesome in camp. Really, really awesome in camp. In fact, like I was saying, he looks like the main guy. He looks like the starting slot guy. Gidry's right behind him, and Eccles has looked good too. So I'm kind of good in the slot. If we were going to go slot, yes, Brian Poole's available. Hey, if you want a good joke, Buster Scrine is still available. <laughs> we're not signing him. That guy is not being signed. So we are not signing Buster Scrine, but he's still available. But Brian Poole's available. I mentioned I like Nickel Roby Coleman. I am a Roby Coleman fan, but these are slot guys. So I don't think we're going for any slot guys. That's just the way I look at it. And as I mentioned during the season, uh, as the offseason went on, I was saying the longer we didn't sign Brian Poole, the more fate that showed that Joe Douglas had in uh, Javelin Gidry. And as I've said everything about Javelin Gidry, Michael Carter's looked even better. Michael Carter II has looked very impressive as a slot corner. So I think we're good there. Like Tom said, forget Buster. Man, Buster was rough, man. Buster Scrine, like just going off for a little bit. So I don't know what I'm calling Scrine, it's Screen. Buster Screen was like the worst penalized corner like ever. Like that dude was good for like four flags a game. Like if he wasn't ripping your jersey off, he couldn't cover you. Man, that was tough. It was tough with Buster Screen. Because with Screen, again, when he got away with that shit, he played pretty well. But he was penalized a lot. So Jeremy points out, shout out to you guys again. Appreciate you guys here. Jeremy says he think Poole's probably asking for too much. It's possible, man. I mean, Poole could be asking for too much because he's not bad. I mean, the dude was a, you know, had a 77 PFF last year, and you remember he was good for the Jets before that. We go back to 2019, 79. We go back to 2018. It's loading. We got to give it a minute. It's working at a snail's pace. That actually wasn't as good. So that's interesting. So he was not as good in 2018. But in 2019 with us, he was very good. And then last year, he was good too. I think his age also plays a factor because, again, He'll be 29 when next season really starts getting going because he turns 29 at the end of October. So he's only a slot guy, even though he's big, like he's got a big body, he's only 5'9". So he's a slot guy. We're good in the slots. Like I said, we're not, I don't think we're bringing him on. I honestly don't. Guys like Brian Poole, guys like Nickel Roby Coleman, as much as I like them, I'm excited about Michael Carter. I'm excited about Javelin Gidry. Like I'm like, can't emphasize how excited I am about those guys. Like we're like our corner situation. We don't have to worry about the slot. 
Like, I'm very excited about the slot right now. So you got Michael Carter, you got Javelin Guidry, you got Brandon Eccles, who looked pretty good as well. We said Hall's that starting outside guy. And again, that second spot, we could bring in a Steven Nelson. I don't think we'll bring in a Richard Sherman, but he's available. So it's interesting. One guy that I also like, he's not really an outside guy, but I was a fan of him with the Philadelphia Eagles, is Cravon LeBlanc. I think Craven LeBlanc is slept on because he was an undrafted guy. I don't think he gets enough credit. I mean, he's not really big enough to play on the outside. He has, but he's not really that big enough to really play on the outside. But he's had a couple of good years. In uh, 20, I think it was 20, let me see. In 2017, he had a 73.9. In 2019, he had about a 70. He's an interesting one. So I kind of liked him as like an under the radar kind of signing. If you brought in like a cheap guy, like a cheap guy to be like depth. I kind of like that. So those are a couple of names. You got Steven Nelson. You got Crave on the blank. Richard Sherman, who I don't think is going to be the option. Poole, Nickel Roby Coleman. But honestly, out of all of them, the only one that really does make sense is Steven Nelson. Because again, Crave on the blank, Brian Poole. Nickel Roby Coleman, they're all slot corners. All those guys are really slot corners. And like I just said, I think Poole is still a free agent for a reason. Like, uh, like I think it was uh, Jeremy who said, yeah. Jeremy said that Poole might be asking for too much. I mean, I think it's also faith in these guys. I think Joe Douglas and even Robert Sala really likes what he's seeing in Michael Carter II, really likes what he's seeing in him, and really likes Javelin Guidry as well. But Michael Carter II has really, really been shining. So that's the way I look at it. I mean, I don't think we really need to bring in a guy. I like the guys we have, but hey, those are options. So again, Robert Sala said he's not doing it now. He wants to see what these young guys can do. I, as you guys know, I really like Jason Pinnock. I just want to keep throwing that out because I think the way I'm looking at Pinnock is the same way I was looking at Bryce Hall. Like I just saw so much potential as a coverage lockdown corner, like that physical elite coverage lockdown corner that presses you, that manhandles you, that picks the ball off. Like that's what I like about him. So I'm really excited in him. But Isaiah Dunn looked great. And Austin didn't look bad either. So Robert Sala might be ready to roll with those three guys. Robert Sala might say, we got Hall on the outside. Let's see which one of those three guys can step up. And the slot is set. I mean, the slot's got Michael Carter killing it and taking names. Javelin Guidry looking amazing last year with a lot of potential. This is exciting. But again, if they do bring someone in, there are those options. So out of all those names, as I mentioned, I think the only one that makes sense is Steven Nelson. But again, guys, I got to emphasize, don't look at Steven Nelson as the end-all be-all, as the fix-it for this team. Steven Nelson is not that kind of a corner. You're not bringing in like a Richard Sherman in his prime. Steven Nelson was never a CB1, ever, even on his best years. So at most, he's going to be a decent CB2, a decent complement to Bryce Hall. But as we said, maybe Dunn looks just as good. Maybe Pinnock looks just as good. We're going to see. So Zach brings up, <clears throat> shout out to Zach. I love the optimism, man. You know, shout out, bro. I love that optimism. Is there any chance to win the wild card spot this year? I mean, anything's possible. I mean, the beauty of this right now, and I pointed this out for when the season begins, no team is going to be able to have a beat on us because we're new. We're bringing in something new to this equation. Robert Sala, Zach Wilson, these guys have never been together before. If teams want to analyze these guys, they're going to have to analyze film and, and the ability of Zach Wilson at BYU while they look at Robert Sala with the 49ers and Michael LaFleur in his receiver role because, yes, he was not an OC before. They don't know this yet. So we're coming in with unexpected. What we need to do is punch them in the mouth right out of the gate. That's the way I'm looking at this. Teams will not have a beat on us in the beginning of the season. They will not have film they can go to. They're going to have to, like I said, synthesize from all different places and try to put it together 
but they won't have what's actually going to happen. So we can take them by storm. So probably by week three, because again, this is the NFL. These guys are making the big bucks for a reason. By week three, they're going to be watching that film. They're going to be diving in to what we did week one and two and starting to pick it up. But those first two, maybe even three weeks, we're going to be a wild card. Speaking of wild cards, Zach, they're not going to know what's coming at them. So I want to punch those teams in the face. I want to come out hard, ready to go. And Zach Wilson, man, you know he's the guy. I'm big on Zach. You guys know everything I've said on Zach. Yes, he's a rookie. Yes, we need to remember that, that he's a rookie playing in his first NFL games. But, man, I knew this kid was going to be special. But in camp, in OTAs, in minicamp, he was just killing it. Remember, Connor Hughes said, this kid doesn't look good for a rookie. This kid just looks good. Like, period. He looks good. Like, and I said it before. I tweeted it the other day. I thought about it. I'm standing by it. I think Zach Wilson in his rookie year, will put up better numbers than Sam Darnold will in his fourth year. Yes. Zach Wilson is the man. So yes, Zachary, it's possible. It's going to come down to, again, how well this team gels together, how well they come out of the gate playing well together, and how good Zach Wilson looks. Because again, these are all new variables. New head coach, new OC, new quarterback. But again, like I was saying, and like Jeremy's saying, same point, no, excuse me, nobody's going to see us coming. Because again, they can't. They've never seen Robert Sala coaching the Jets with Mike LaFleur as the OC, incorporating a Shanahan-like offense, but his version of it with Zach Wilson, a quarterback. They can't prepare for that. They don't know that. Unless they're freaking Bill, unless they're Bill Belichick with their damn Spygate cameras in the stands, they're not going to know. They're not going to see us coming, and we need to punch them in the mouth. So that's the way I look at it. And I see a lot of you guys like Jeremy. You're agreeing, man. By week three or four, these NFL teams, they're NFL teams for money, for a reason. They know how to make their money. They're going to catch up. They're going to start watching the film from what we did those first few weeks. But those first few weeks. We can catch teams off guard. Even week two and three, we'll be able to throw things at them that we didn't do in the first couple of weeks. So we need to be, in my opinion, we need to be fast out of the gate. We need to be strong. We need to be unique. We need to keep changing it up on them. We need to keep them guessing. But it all comes down to how well this team gels in this new system with Zach Wilson. Zach Wilson is the quarterback. He will make or break whatever happens. And as you guys know, as I've said, the potential is through the roof, absolutely through the roof, but, but he's still a rookie and we need to keep that in mind. So right now it's very interesting. Back to your question, Zach, of can it happen? It can happen, but it also may not start out great. That's the point. We don't know. I'm hoping it starts great. But remember, as you guys, as you know, as I've told you guys in past takes of mine, I'm not so wrapped up in wins and losses this year. I know that when Joe Douglas took his six-year contract, when Robert Sala demanded a six-year contract, they knew. Remember, I said it in my Joe Douglas episode. Remember, uh, it was two episodes ago when I did the episode all on Joe Douglas. Remember, when he was brought in, he was brought into an impossible situation. I mean, you want to talk about the dysfunction of the Jets. Set, guys. You want to talk about the dysfunction of the Jets. How about the dysfunction of what Joe Douglas was brought in? Remember, free agency is over. The draft is over. Team's built. It's all done. Do you want it? So he demanded a long-term contract for a reason. Anything that's good is not quick. And anything that's built right is not done fast. If you want it done right, it's not going to be a quick fix. Now, don't get me wrong. Joe Douglas has freaking killed it so far. You guys remember, if you haven't seen it, go back, check out my episode you know, two episodes ago, the one that was literally all about Joe Douglas. Why, you know, I've been saying Joe Douglas is a great GM. I've been saying it since the first draft. Joe Douglas is a great GM. Everyone's like, why are you saying it? That's the reasons why. All there. But back to the reasons why, he was smart in 2020 with his free agency so he could do what he did this year. Joe Douglas had the Best free agency, according to Bleacher Report, 
And when it came to the draft, everybody gave us A grades. It was A, A minus across the board. So I'm excited. I think our team is very well built. I think Joe Douglas is bringing in the right guys, guys with a lot of talent, guys with a lot of potential, like we said with what Robert Sala wants, guys that love football, guys that want to be competitive, guys that want to play. This is exciting. This is the beginning of something. But again, it's the beginning of something. You can't get to the end immediately. And if you want to get to the end immediately, bring back Mike McCagnan, because that's what he tried to do. In 2015, he tried to buy a team because he couldn't draft. You guys remember my whole rant about guys who, you know, buy players because they can't draft. That's all they're doing. They don't know how to evaluate talent. So they're saying, I don't know how to do it. I'm going to let someone else do it for me. So you can't do that. That's not how it works. You cultivate talent. You build through the draft. You bring in the right guys. And like Jeremy says, 11 picks in 2022. Joe knows what he's doing, guys. This is all about long term. Remember, I said it. Joe Douglas is playing chess when everyone else is playing checkers. It's not about short term. It's about long term. This guy knows what he's doing. Trading away, but like last year, trading away older guys for picks, accumulating picks. We lit it up in last year's in in this year's draft, had one of the best drafts of anybody. And like Jeremy says, 11 picks next year for 2022. So is it possible that we make the wild card? Hell yeah, it's definitely possible. Zach Wilson could come out gangbusters. Zach Wilson could be everything I expect him to be immediately. He could be great. He could be uh, he, could, he could have precision. He could make excellent decisions with a talent, talented team around him. That team is stacked. Robert Sala could be an excellent coach. It could all be there. But again, it may take time. So for me, I want to see things moving in the right direction. I want to see us winning games. I want to see the talent playing well. I want to see us moving in a positive direction. I want to see Zach Wilson getting better, making better decisions, playing better. I want to see the team playing better, gelling better. That's what I'm looking for. So yes, this team has a ton of potential, ton of potential. Like, uh, like John, like I was saying, punch him at the line of scrimmage. Get him at the front, man. We're coming out of the gate. They don't know what's hitting them. They don't know what's coming. They've never prepared for this before. This is new. So we got to hit him in the mouth and we got to hit him hard and we can win those first couple of games. So if we win those first couple of games, that could be interesting. Hell, if we start the season 3-0, and man, man, you know how those conversations are going to go. It's going to be great. If we start the season 3-0, and that would be wonderful. So the potential is there. We can smack him in the mouth quick because they're not going to know what's coming. Eventually, they're going to catch on. Playoff potential is there. But again, I just want to see the right progression. If we have six to eight wins at the end of the year, but... Zach Wilson's looked infinitely better. He looks like our QB of the future. He's making the right decisions. Our talent looks good. The young guys are stepping up. Then I'm excited. I know that we're moving in the right direction. Because remember, Rome wasn't built in a day. It could definitely happen. It could definitely happen. But it was not built in a day. And nothing that's worth anything is easy or quick. So Joe's got this. And he's going to build us and put us in success. So I'm excited, man. I'm excited. So love it, Jeremy. Thank you, man. You want to play? I'm excited, man. Let's do it. I'm ready. I'm ready to go, man. And it's all Joe Douglas. It's Joe Douglas. It's Robert Sala. This is exciting stuff. It really, really is. So I don't know if you guys have anybody else you want to bring up. The episode, I, you know, I was going to get into all the corner situation. That's the guys I was going to talk about. And again, guys, I see a bunch of you guys in here. Appreciate all of you tuning in. Thank you for being here like always. Ask anything, you know? Bring it up. Ask a question. Ask about a guy you like. Ask my opinion on something. If you want to bring up something about another position, feel free. Totally up to you guys. But I'm excited, man. I really, really am. So the potential is there. We have all the pieces. Matt, Joe Douglas, Robert Sala, Michael Floor, like John says, all gas, no break. I'm just loving it. Zach Wilson, he's the answer. We finally have a quarterback. That's the answer. And that's the way we got to look at it. 
So am I going to watch? Of course I'm watching, man. I can't wait. In fact, I was actually going to say it's about starting in a minute. So if you guys are ready, Flight 2021 is going to be starting. Jet's going to be putting that out. You're going to get to be seeing behind the scenes, the behind the scenes of Robert Sala, the behind the scenes of Joe Douglas. That's going to be some exciting stuff. Man, Jeremy brings up, did you see those goofs that rank Sala sixth as the head coach? Man, those are the same goofs that have Jason, La, Confortana, whatever his name is. Could you believe the stuff that guy was saying? He's just trying to create riffs, and that's what these guys are doing. They love hitting on the Jets, like Zach says. They love crapping on our team, but you know what? They're running out of shit. And that's what Jason proved. All the stuff coming out of his mouth was bullshit. I don't have it in front of me right now. <clears throat> so I don't have the exact quote, but I remember it was stuff like bringing up vaccine stuff. Like it's no one's personal decision. Like, you know what guys, I'm a teacher and I think the vaccine is good, but our country was founded on free choice. Our country was founded on free speech, free choice. I think it's crazy. That's what they're making this conversation into. It's like, what is your personal choice? Zach Wilson, tell me your personal choice so we can attack you. And it, it, it's just ridiculous. So that's not part of the conversation. That's because they don't want to give Zach Wilson the credit. Like Connor Hughes has said, Zach Wilson doesn't look good for a rookie. Zach Wilson just looks good. He looks good, period. He looks like he's ready to freaking go. And they don't like it. They don't like it. And you guys remember, everyone says the Jet LOL narrative isn't real. It's not real. Well, here's my answer to those guys. If you want to go by, you say the Jets are a bad team that can't win anything. Well, we won a Super Bowl once. The Detroit Lions, they ain't won shit. The Detroit Lions have been around as long as anybody. They're an original NFL franchise, and they haven't won shit. Not only have they not won the Super Bowl, they've never even won an NFL championship before the Super Bowl existed. Yet, you never see them shitting on them. They don't shit on the Lions half as much as they shit on the Jets. So when they say it's, oh, because the Jets always lose, well, the Lions lose more. Well, what's the next argument? The next argument, oh, well, the Jets go through quarterbacks like a quarterback carousel. The Cleveland Browns quarterback carousel makes our quarterback carousel look like nothing. They went through like 24 quarterbacks in like 10 years. Like that was ridiculous. That was a revolving door for quarterbacks. But they don't talk about the Browns and they don't talk about the Lions the same way they talk about the Jets. So yeah, the Jets are everyone's low-hanging fruit. But you saw that with Jason, whatever his stupid last name is. I, I couldn't believe he was saying that stuff. You know, saying that Woody Johnson was giving bad answers. It's crazy, man. It's all BS. And all that shows is that they have nothing to say. They're just trying to stir the pot. That's all it is. They're stirring the pot because they got nothing to say because they know that the Jets are bringing the heat and the Jets are bringing it and we're not the team we used to be. This is not the LOL Jets. Joe Douglas started the beginning of that culture change. Robert Sala was part of that culture change. Joe Douglas bringing in the right guys, bringing in talent, cultivating it. Robert Sala making guys want to be here, play for him, coaching well. And now Zach Wilson, the rookie quarterback that again, just looks good. This kid looks great. He's been lighting it up. He's been looking really good. He's doing excellent throws. This is what we want to see. So as you guys know, Take Flight's going to be starting pretty right about now. So we got Take Flight 2021 starting. Uh, so that was all of it. We got into all the cornerback situation. Again, guys, don't sleep on them. It's going to be an exciting. We got Hall at that CB1. We got an interesting battle at CB2. Any of those three guys, Pinnock, Austin, or Dunn, all three of them have looked pretty good. So let's see who gets it. Maybe we don't need a veteran. And then in the slot, we're more than fine. Javelin Guidry, all the stats I mentioned, Michael Carter, lighting it up in camp. It's an interesting situation, okay? So like always, I appreciate you guys being here. Thank you for tuning in to the Take Flight Spit and Fire podcast. Hope you guys tune in to Take Flight 2021. You got it coming on right now. As you guys know, we're here every Monday, 7 p.m., live on YouTube. I appreciate all of you guys. Thank you for being here. and. Have a wonderful, wonderful Monday evening. Enjoy Take Flight.